I first heard the words global warming in 1996 in my introduction to environmental studies class at my university. I was blown away by what my professor told us during our first lecture, that human activities were increasing Earth's temperatures and altering weather patterns, which was going to have devastating and irreversible effects on our ecosystems. I was thrown into a state of panic for the entire semester. I called every relative I knew and told them about global warming. I instructed my family to immediately limit their driving, and I warned my friends that I might move to the environmental house on campus. No one seemed bothered by my antics, other than my mother, who said I was being overdramatic. I was perplexed. Why weren't other people as worried as I was? Fast forward to the summer of 2014, when within two weeks of discovering that I landed my dream job in Panama, I packed up my tiny studio apartment in New York I said goodbye to my friends and family in the United States, and I made my way to the beautiful archipelago of Bocas del Toro. Though I was surrounded by water in New York City, I felt completely disconnected from the ocean, and that I wasn't connected to or making a large enough impact in our fight to combat climate change. So I traded having everything at my fingertips for rubber boots and scuba gear, home-cooked meals, and making do with what I had. Never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined how different my life would become. There are many roots to the complex problem of curbing the effects of climate change. At the heart of it is our failure to change our behavior, and that is rooted in our culture. On Isla Colon, where I live, there are no traffic lights and only two main roads exist. And yet, the natural ecosystems that so define this region, the coral reefs, mangrove forests, and seagrass beds are in serious decline due to a combination of both local and global pressures. In New York, I had the complete luxury of never having to wonder how my actions impacted other places in the world. Growing up in the United States, the world's most highly ranked individualistic society afforded me this perceived right. As individuals, we are taught, we have the right to be independent. We have the freedom to choose and we can do what is best for ourselves. But how is individualism justified when it comes to global crises such as climate change? The panic I felt about climate change in 1996 propelled me to a career in the sciences. I am a marine and conservation biologist, educator, and advocate for the ocean. Oddly, I arrived at this highly collaborative intersection in a very individualistic manner. And as scientists, we apply the highly individualistic ideals and principles that we are taught to projects all over the world without giving much consideration to whether or not the places in which we work actually value individualism. Our efforts can cause and have caused serious harm and conflict. For example, what happens when value systems clash, when trying to design or even expand marine protected areas without considering the wants and needs of a highly collectivistic society such as Panama? Marine protected areas are tools used by conservationists to protect habitat and to restore and protect biodiversity. In an ideal situation, natural and social scientists, policymakers, government agents, nonprofits, and the greater community come together to define park boundaries and weigh the pros and cons of where these boundaries should be placed. But we know this is not always the case. We know that in some areas, the voices and values of the people who are impacted the most by the presence of MPAs are often not part of the planning process. As we race to protect 30% of the world's oceans by 2030, we have to be sure that where and when we begin to draw lines is inclusive of not only the science, but the culture, history, 
and value systems of the people who live closest to these protected areas. As humans, it seems, we can't help but try to make sense of our natural world by putting up boundaries, drawing lines, and thinking that marine creatures and people will somehow come to naturally recognize and respect these. For my work in Bocas del Toro, this has required a recognition and shift away from my individualistic scientific culture of implementing ideas that are deeply entrenched in traits such as self-reliance, autonomy, and the need for individual achievement, and a shift toward implementing ideas for conservation of marine spaces that are well aligned with the collectivistic values of the culture in the region that are focused on relationships, community connectedness, and group success. Worldwide, over 10,000 MPAs have been designated, and these represent only about 5% of the world's oceans. We also know from studies looking at the global efficacy of MPAs that greater than 50% of marine parks studied around the world do not meet effective planning and management MPA features. And more recent studies have found that the most effective MPAs are no-take and are those with the strongest protections. My work in Bocas del Toro, looking at mangrove habitat complexity and connectivity, supports previous research in the region that the most complex habitats that support species richness and diversity are not located within the boundaries of the Isla Bastimentos National Marine Park. This marine park was established in 1988 with the goals of conserving a representative sample of the valuable marine and coastal ecosystems of the Panamanian Caribbean through the implementation of programs and activities established in its management plan to protect these ecosystems with the help of communities and local actors. If we want to protect these ecosystems, then we need to make sure that the representative samples of the marine ecosystems in Bocas include the most complex habitats in order to see improvement. With little enforcement, a small size, fishing permitted in designated zones, and its proximity to human, human activity, though it may be old, the Isla Bastimentos National Marine Park unfortunately does not currently meet effective management standards. Large-scale, long-term studies of the presence of MPA in Bocas have not been conducted and it is unknown whether fish biomass or species richness has increased. Importantly, no studies have been conducted to determine the benefit or the detriment of the MPA to people living on its borders. We need to reimagine how MPAs are designed, implemented, and enforced, and most importantly, rethink how to better integrate the home culture of where MPAs are placed in management plants. What if we first considered how local societies view and place value on the area to be protected and how it should be enforced? We are running out of time and creating new parks or expanding existing parks without taking people into consideration will only lead to greater conflict and poor outcomes. Bocas del Toro contains 50% of all of Panama's mangrove forests on the Caribbean coast. I believe that the archipelago of Bocas del Toro is a national treasure, as mangroves play a critical role in the sequestration of carbon. As tourism grows in the region and more pressure is placed on mangrove ecosystems by the removal of mangroves to build docks and to build hotels and homes, we must ask ourselves, is it more valuable to leave mangrove forests intact than it is to remove them? It is impossible to know the entire economic loss of mangrove removal. But when we lose mangroves, we lose this incredibly important natural way 
to sequester carbon, and we lose the vit vitally important habitats these forests provide, both above and below water. While we know that their value is priceless, studies conducted in Panama's Chiriqui province estimate that the economic value of mangroves in the region is somewhere around $32 million. Here's an example of where the cost of removing these highly valuable natural resources potentially greatly outweighs the benefit of unregulated tourism and development. If amplification of the MPA in Bocas is to happen, it is imperative that we include as many mangroves, coral reefs, and other complex habitats such as seagrasses as possible. To inform MPA design, we need to study our seascapes similarly to the way we study and map our landscapes. We need to look at the contour of the seafloor, study the structure of substrates, understand the role of holes and spaces, include studies of mangrove root structure, study what organisms live on proppers and how they support connectivity of species between habitats. We need to think differently. We must think grander, and we must recognize that bound the boundaries we have drawn mean absolutely nothing to the organisms that call the ocean home. How do we move forward? Well, first, we have to know where we stand. Helpful standardized methods, such as the MPA guide, can help. And we need to know how well an MPA is doing prior to making any changes to it. How do we know if an MPA is effective? Second, if we want to make changes, we have to ask the people of the region if they think this is actually a good idea. We need to include indigenous knowledge and understand culturally important practices. If boundaries are expanded, how will local people be incorporated in the plan of expansion? What is happening culturally? What's happening socially and economically? Third, we need science to support these changes. What areas are the most complex and important to include in an MPA? What role do these habitats play in improving biomass and diversity? Fourth, sustainable financing is critical to the mission of protecting 30% of the ocean by 2030. And we must add into the equation natural resource economics for long-term, sustained, and continued success. We can no longer afford to continue to operate in old, outdated conservation models that tell us that nature is good and people are bad. People and nature have been intertwined and deeply connected since the evolution of Homo sapiens almost 350,000 years ago. At some point, humans decided that we needed to create boundaries and put up fences to manage nature, and at some point, this included the removal of people, often violently and viciously, that were deemed a threat to the idea of what nature was supposed to be. When we think of Yellowstone, and when we think of Serengeti, we note that indigenous peoples have been forcibly removed in order to create a boundary for nature that is free of humans. Imagine all of the knowledge that was lost when those spaces were created, and what knowledge we are now currently losing from not including local knowledge in the planning and development of, of these spaces. Natural and social science, economics, social justice, race and ethnicity, equity, poverty, education, and the environment, these are all essential to MPA design. Ultimately, our ability to reimagine MPAs rests in our ability to practice cultural competence. It's time to reimagine the boundaries of MPAs in ways that recognize collectivistic cultures values indigenous knowledge, integrates people and the spaces to be conserved, and supports local communities that depend on these spaces for survival. 
without more unified approaches for solving some of the greatest threats we currently face, such as climate change, then increases in conflicts between those who feel the benefits of healthy natural resources and those who feel excluded will only continue to proliferate. We know that climate change is impacting our daily lives, but many of us just either don't know what to do, feel helpless or disconnected, or are apathetic to thinking about how to make change. I am hopeful, but our collective success greatly depends on inclusivity and equity as we all try to grapple with the unequal impacts of climate change globally. Nelson Mandela once said, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. At its very core, conservation has to be rooted in equity for ultimate success. So let's start reimagining how we can not only use MPAs as a tool for conservation, but as a means to uplift, respect, and enhance others. People and nature are not separate, and the science that informs our policies and conservation practices surrounding MPAs must reflect that.